welcome to the Bread of Life Bible Study. I'm your host, Pastor Derek Thomas, and my prayer is that the Bible study today truly blesses you, strengthens you, encourages you, and teaches you how to be a carrier of the bread of life for a dying and sin-sick world. God bless. And praise God for, for the time that we have together. And as you can see, we're, we're at lesson five in our Purpose Driven Life series. We're, we're coming down the home stretch with it. And this week, we're going to talk about ministry, uh, the, the importance of ministry and understanding how purpose and ministry coexist. And I mean, it's really a, a question that's so easy to ask, you know, what is ministry? People say it all the time, you know, it's something that's spoken of often in uh, ministry circles. What's your ministry? You know, pastor, what's your ministry? Uh, what's your ministry? Whatever it might be. And people get so caught up in seeking what one's ministry is that they forget, I feel, at times, what ministry is itself. Ministry in, mm -hmm. a, in and of itself literally means help. That's what the word ministry means. It means to help. And, you know, a lot of times we forget about the help dynamic as it pertains to ministry. And we just want to get caught up in the accolades. I, I call it getting caught up in the glory of it and not understanding the power that's associated with it. You know, we think about it and, and hear, um, you know, some of the prayers, you know, that we talk about, you know, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And, you know, people want to get caught up in the glory of ministry, the accolades of it. But, you know, a lot of people fail to realize there's power involved in ministry, in, in, in serious ministry. If one wants to be sincere about ministry, you know, one has to realize that that there really is a power dynamic associated with a ministry and with effective ministry. And God desires us to engage in effective ministry in this season, and he desires us to truly strive to be all that we can be for him and, and for his glory. And with that in mind, we want to understand, come to gain a better understanding of the purpose of our ministry, because we each have you know, individual ministries, whether we believe it or not, whether we realize it or not. Second Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2, are where we want to start tonight. And they say, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, it sounds like there's a lot there to unpack, and there is a lot there to unpack. But the blessing of it is, is that what we have to unpack is something that's very, very important and something that's very, very needed for us to truly understand the, 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 the magnitude of what it is that we've been called to, which is ministry. And the first thing we, we realize, obviously, in this passage of scripture is that we have it. Each and every one of us have a ministry. So whether you understand it or not, whether you believe it or not, I'm here to let you know with the word to back it up that you have a ministry, which means if you have a ministry, guess what that makes you? That makes you a minister. Mm -hmm. A minister is an individual that has a ministry, which means each and every one of us have the ability to help somebody and because each and every one of us have the ability to help somebody each and every one of us are classified by god as his divine helpers and our purpose as we look at it this week is gaining an understanding of how god wants to use us to help so in in, in looking at that and in talking about that the point to ponder that the lord gave for this week is this you know, our purpose is to serve others with our gifts in order to give him glory. And, and God called each of us to do just that. He called each of us to be a help to other people. The word lets us know that no individual is an island unto himself or unto herself, but instead we've been created and blessed to be a blessing and create blessings in the lives of others. So the question I want to pose on the floor tonight is this, what makes my ministry, and the my is referring to you yourself, what makes my ministry so important to God and to others? That's the question I want to pose tonight where we start. So how, how, would, how, would, how would you respond to that question? Anybody, how, how would you respond to that? When the question is asked, what makes my ministry so important to God and to others? 
<clears throat> because it could potentially be um, that I'm being used um, as a bridge between both God and others. And, um, you know, I mean, woe, woe unto me if uh, I'm not an open-ended vessel both ways to receive from God and, 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 and be a conduit for what he's trying to give to someone else through me to either just by neglect or by error to lead astray or, and because of, 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 of I guess the particular dynamic or the combination uh, that, that is my ministry in Christ, it could be very, very likely um, that I could potentially be someone astray. Um, you know, I mean, like you said, you get you get caught. It's easy to get caught up in the in the glory of it and um, begin to lean on your own understanding or to to revel in um, others' attention uh, and affection and adoration that really, really, you know, is supposed to be pointed to God. So you don't want to you you don't want to be that that short circuit. You don't want to be that that um, that faulty connection between God and someone else. Um, that's not a good, uh, that's not a good position. It's very dangerous, uh, for, for the minister. Um, it's very unfair to, um, the people that are supposed to be, uh, ministered, uh, to, you know, we're just a, a branch. We're just a branch. If we abide, then we bear the fruit that feeds others. But if we we become detached and that, you know, the fruit becomes tainted. It's not truly, it's not truly good. And that's just not, uh, that's exactly against what, what uh, glorifying God is actually. It's worse than having an opposing view in ways. Very true. All, all very true. V very well said. Very, very well said. Very true. Anyone else? What, what makes what makes my ministry make it personal so so important to God and the others? Um. Well, not to sound the wrong way, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but He made me in a in a certain way that He didn't make everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be certain things that I can only do in a certain way, or that I might be like just more gifted to do, or certain people that I might be better able to understand or reach. And so those people might not be reached without a person like me that has that type of understanding or like the fact that I'm a nurse and I also believe that he's give, gifted me with healing. And so I actually kind of know the medical side, but I also believe in the spiritual healing and, and, and using that as well. So Absolutely. something like that. Absolutely. Very well said. Excellent point. Both both of you make fantastic points, and particularly, I mean, and you you both really spoke to the different things that that this lesson is going to explore. Uh, the first thing, um, no, you, you hit on it almost verbatim. You know, the ministry is important to God because first of all, you were created for a unique role on the earth that no one else can fill, that no one else can fill, and that speaks to the scope of your ministry, you know, and it's important to understand the different facets of ministry that we're going to look at. Um, the scope of one's ministry means it, it's, it's, desi it's designed to cover a certain region. It's designed to cover a certain area. It's designed to cover a certain field. And ultimately those things are designed to meet certain needs and to fulfill a certain purpose which really speaks middle to what you are saying, you know, as a nurse, you know, you have the gifts and talents and graces that are unique to individuals that are gifted as nurses to serve a service. Even within the medical field, as a nurse, a doctor can't do things that nurses can the way that a nurse can do them because a doctor's not a nurse, you know, um, can they do things similar? Sure. Can they do the natural 
uh, acts of some things, I will venture to guess so. But just as you said, the intangible, the caring dynamic, okay, the, 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 the dynamic that, that, that prompts one to help, that's what makes the difference. That's what ministry is all about. The scope of one's ministry is I'm equipped to help in this fashion. I'm equipped to help in this way. And in seeking my purpose, God, help me understand just how far the ministry that you've entrusted to me reaches. You know, show me where my area of, 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 of influence is. Show me where my sphere of influence is. Because where my sphere of influence is, that's where I can make the greatest impact. We're, we're planting an East Point. So if we're planting an East Point, we shouldn't be spending all of our time up in Alpharetta if East Point is the area that God has given us to help people. Because if God has given us the area of East Point to help people, he's given us the gifts and talents and graces that we need through our experiences as members, through our experiences as, as charter members, through our uh, capacity to influence, through our life experiences, through our you know, um, acumen and, and, and mental capability and all that stuff. He's equipped us uniquely for that scope, that region. So we can't expect to go into someone else's region or into a region that we're not anointed to make that measure of impact and expecting to make that measure of impact because when we do that, we're out of line and we're out of order. You know, can we go in that area and evangelize? Of course. Can we go in that area and feed the hungry? Absolutely. Can we go in that area and preach and teach the gospel? Most definitely. Can we go in that area and souls be saved? I would venture to say yes. Mm -hmm. But this speaks to the difference of being in God's permissive will and being in God's perfect will. And the key to be most effective within the scope of ministry that's been entrusted to you is to find a way to continue to walk in God's perfect will. Because when we walk in God's perfect will, just as you said, uh, Sister Mel, we, we have taken all of our members, all of our talents, all of our faculties, and we've lined them up underneath God's desire for what he wants to do in and through our lives and alongside his vision for what he desires to do in an area. And he's showing us what to do and showing us how to do what he desires us to do to make an impact. And when we do it that way and we do it with God's purpose at the forefront, we become far, far more impactful than we would if we were just doing it on our own. We look at it scripturally, Ephesians deals with it in the fourth chapter with verses 11 and 13. It, and it says very clearly, he gave some to be apostles, he gave some to be prophets, he gave some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For me, this is the payoff. This is the scope of ministry. The, each of those offices are a scope, okay? The apostolic office is a scope, the prophetic office is a scope, the evangelistic office is a scope, and so on. And people tend to get caught up, going back to what I said about the glory dynamic, people tend to get caught up in the glory associated with their office. And then it gets real dangerous when one is, you know, operating, you know, carnal minded, they'll start thinking about, well, why am I an evangelist when I could be walking in an apostolic office? Why am I an, ap an apostle when I could be walking in a pastoral office? When they start, we start coveting one another's gifting and one another's ministry. And that's really a no-no because the, the thing about it is that God has different areas and creates different models, if you will. But the payoff is after the different models. And look at what it says after it says apostles, prophets, etc. This is the one thing that Every model is designed to do for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what all that's saying is, whether you are gifted and your ministry is an apostolic one or a prophetic one or an evangelistic one, or you have the heart of a shepherd, or if you're anointed to teach, or if you're gifted to help, or you've been gifted to encourage and exhort, or you've been gifted to whatever your gifting is, is not about the advantages that you gain with that gift. It's about you using that gift in conjunction with the other gifts that are at your disposal you know, for the perfecting of mature or maturing of the saints so that they can do the work of ministry so that the body of the Christ can be, body of Christ rather, can be edified or strengthened 
until we all come into the unity of that faith and knowledge of the Son of God at a maturity level so that we can then stand in God's presence and hear him say, well done. Our job is to take the little portion of the great commission that we've been given. And our purpose is to take the ministry gifts that we have, like the two fish and the five loaves of bread, and, 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 and give them offer them to God and bless them and begin to break them off and begin to distribute them into the lives of people. And as we do that, what happens is not only do we see that like in that particular parable, that story that the fish and the loaves didn't run out, but there was an abundance left over, so there was overflow. And God desires to use us in our ministry to bring about overflow so that we in turn can have overflow in and with our ministry. You may say, Pastor, overflow where? Overflow in membership, overflow in our finances, overflow in favor, overflow in every area so that we not only have enough, but we have more than enough. And when we have that more than enough and we've met the need in the scope that we have, then we can begin to broaden our scope and say, Lord, what will we do with the overflow? Then he'll do like, like the prayer of Jabez says, he will enlarge our territories. He will expand our borders. And we may go from just ministering to East Point to moving into College Park, which is next door, or moving the other way into Forest Park, which is also next door. And before you know it, he may give us all three of those territories. And we move into the next area. And before you know it, we've taken Atlanta proper. And not only the city, we've taken the region, and that's how it works. But God will not entrust any more to us than he sees that we're able to effectively and properly handle. And notice I said till that, that, uh, that until he sees that we can effectively and properly handle it, because we may look at it like, well, I got this, but our scope could be off. And if our scope is off, we can make a mess, but God's scope is never off. So it's, it's critical for us to understand the scope of our ministry and that we've been created for the little portion of glory and power that God has entrusted to us to use to give back to him, not to give to ourselves. Make sense? Yes, sir. So above and beyond that, that's the first reason. The second reason that our mere ministry is important to God is because every believer, not just clergy, is called to God's service. Okay, let me say that again. Every believer, not just clergy, is called to God's service. And that's the essence of your ministry. And remember, the, the, the ministry, the word ministry literally means to help. So what this is saying is that your ministry is important to God because no man or woman is an island unto himself or herself, meaning no man or woman walks in all nine of the ministry gifts, the primary ministry gifts. There's only one individual that did that. That's Jesus Christ. He was apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, priest, king, etc., etc. He was all nine of them. But because we couldn't handle that, it's like, did, did, did you all see the, uh, the Avengers movies? Did you all see Endgame? Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. I mean, th think, of, think, of the, think of the ministry gifts like the Infinity Gauntlet. Okay. And each one of those stones carry power, but it took a special individual to be able to handle all those stones at one time. Jesus handled those all, but be, handled it all. But because he knew we couldn't, he broke them up and gave each of us a portion of a stone, if you will, that we can handle. And he does that not for us to say, hey, look at me, but he does that for us to gain an object lesson understanding of the essence of what ministry is. And that's, it's, it, it, ministry is designed to help. So if I have a piece of a stone over here and each of you have pieces of two other stones, I'd be a fool to take my piece of stone and say, I'm gonna hold on to mine. Y'all figure out what y'all do with yours. I'm gonna go find more of mine. Wisdom would say, we take what we got and we may have three fifths of what we, three fifths of what the world might deem as such, but three fifths is more than enough because three is a number of empowerment. And we could take that three fifths and go out and help people with what we have. And in helping people with what we have, because the principle of sowing and reaping does still work, God will begin to send the other ministry gifts so that before you know it, we have a complete picture of what it is that God is striving to do. And with the overflow of what we have, because as he's providing the additional ministry gifts, he's going to provide more of the gifts that we have. 
we can take that extra and begin to expand the, 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 of what we do. We begin to understand the essence of what we do. And that's critical because so many individuals go to churches and think that, well, it's the pastor's job to go out and evangelize. And it's the pastor's job to hold these meetings. And it's the pastor's job to preach on Sunday. And it's the pastor's job to, to do the PR. And it's the pastor's job to clean the, the, the house of God. And, and well, if it's the pastor's job to do everything, why are you here? other than just to, to observe. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm not saying that to be crass or one-sided. I'm saying it because, because the church as a body is a volunteer organization. Many people that come to the church view their role as one of being a volunteer. I mean, if I feel like doing something, I'm going to do something. If I don't feel like doing something, I'm not going to do something. But what God is trying to help us understand is that the, the, the essence of ministry is help. And if the essence of ministry is help and an individual is, is, has been drawn to a ministry and drawn to salvation and has been imparted a ministry by God, they've been given a mandate by God to be a help to the body of Christ. It transcends just the leader, the set man or set woman of the house. It transcends that individual. It, 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 it's not about helping that person per se. It's about helping that person help other people to help God be glorified, to help the gospel be spread throughout the earth. You know, we're, just, we're charged with the same mission. We're charged with the same assignment. The Lord just saw fit to set, you know, this individual as the head of the house. And many people think that it's going back to what I said about the glory dynamic and not understanding that the power comes with the glory. You know, the glory dynamic, oh, it must be glorious to be the pastor. I can tell you from personal experience, it's not in the way that one might think because the pastor is usually the first to start something and the last one to stop, not to receive accolades, but because that's what we're supposed to do. And because we're supposed to do that, you know, the love that we have for the people that we serve, you know, transcends the love that we have for ourselves. And it's not that we loathe ourselves, but it's because the love that we have for others and being a help to others is so great that we put ourselves on the back burner in order to be a blessing to other people. But in essence, that's what Jesus did. Jesus put his own will and his own agenda on the back burner so that he could save each and every one of us. He did what he did that six hours one Friday and the three years in ministry and even the 30 years walking around in, um, uh, sub acceptable living conditions. And, and I'll unpack that in a minute. You know, he did it without complaining, without mumbling, without grumbling. And he did it for us so that we could have this conversation tonight, so that we could gain insights on what God desires to do with us and what he desires to do through us. And what I mean by the sub uh, par living conditions, I have to remember Jesus Christ was. It was and was the son of God. He left his throne at the right hand of the father. He left every royal trapping that he had behind. He left everything in the form of his deity behind and he put on flesh, you know, which was restrictive in relation to what he had in glory. And he wore that for 30 years. You know, think about wearing uh, a suit that's too big or think about wearing a pair of shoes that's too small. And being told that you got to function and you got to work and you got to be a blessing to others. You got to encourage people that are discouraged and, 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 and show love to folks that, that, that don't want to be loved and, and, and be meek and not lash out at folks that are bad mouthing you and plotting to kill you. And when the plot finally gets, you know, executed, you, you're hanging there and pale and people are, are, are throwing wet vinegar at you and throwing insults at you and, and mocking and ridiculing you. And all you do is say, forgive them. That's a hard pill to swallow. But that's what Jesus did. So when we look at it in relation to what Jesus did, yeah, it's work, but you know what it's work I'll gladly do. And every one of us has been assigned a portion of God's service to the earth. And he's, it's been assigned to us, not for accolades, but based on the essence of what ministry is, and that's to help. Jesus came to help because he saw a need. He saw a need because he knew that man, apart from divine intervention, had no hope of being reconciled back to God. 
He saw a need and he loved us enough to not entrust the meeting of that need to anybody else. He did it himself. God is calling us to be individuals to do it ourselves because we want to do it in a way that pleases God. And we want to do it to the best of our ability as right as possible. If we look at Romans 10, verses 13 through 15, it puts it this way in the word. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And now what's happening is the funnel is getting a little bit narrower to where we come in. And how shall they preach except they be what? Sent. Hmm. That means that individuals don't just win. They don't just go. They get sent. And they're sent because the Lord has put a divine unction and calling on their lives to help people. And as much as individuals would love to help the whole world, in most cases, God has not equipped individuals to help the, old, the whole world in and of themselves. But if we do all that we can to help as many people as we can, based on understanding the essence of ministry, as many people as we can within, can within the scope of ministry that God has given us, Inevitably, God is going to allow our path to cross with a brother or sister that may have a different scope than ours, but that has the same essence that they're living by. And then once that happens and that fellowship is formed, then the territory begins to expand and enlarge, and we begin to make a greater impact. And as we do that, that's when God begins to bless, and that's when he's well pleased with us. That's why it goes on to say, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Bring glad tidings, meaning actively doing something, understanding that the help is not just, I'm going to tell you and you do it. The help is, let me share with you, then let me come alongside and show you how to do it. And that's what God is looking for from each of us that have professed the name of Jesus Christ in these days, particularly. He wants us to show people, show people what we're talking about be the change that we want to see in regions. Sh demonstrate the ministry that we profess and proclaim to have because that's the essence of what ministry is. Because the essence of what ministry is is the essence of what love is. And what love is, love does. So if, 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 if the correlation holds true, if what love is, love does, then what ministry is, ministry does. Which leads us to our third reason. The third reason that ministry is important to God is because you serve him by using your God-given abilities to help others. And that speaks straight to the definition of ministry, which is to help. It's a present tense, ongoing proposition. Every day that we live, every day the Lord blesses us to be here on the earth is a gift. And God's desires for us to maximize that gift every single day. And maximizing that gift in the form of ministry isn't always glamorous. It isn't always sexy. Heck, it's not always popular. It's not always well received. But the fact of the matter is we've been placed here to fulfill our God-given mandate by using our God-given abilities to help other people. And, and, and Sister Mel, you, you, you spoke on something earlier um, when you gave your understanding of the question, your answer to the question. You know, you, you started something, you, you started by, by saying, I may not get it exactly correct, but the essence is, and I, my, my intent is not to sound mean, I don't, don't take this the wrong way, you know, and, and by no means did I take it the wrong way. In fact, I would submit to you that that line of thinking isn't the wrong way, it's the right way to think from the standpoint of gaining an understanding of our personal ministry that we have in the earth. Because no two people are exactly alike. You know, God can send two people into the exact same region, give them the exact same scope, give them the exact same uh, sense of urgency with essence, give them the exact same definition, and the interpretation will be totally different because they're two totally different people. 
This could be two people from the from the same family. Heck, this could be twin twins. If if my twin boys, if, if God gave my twin boys the exact same calling, the exact same mandate, the exact same message to go to the exact same region and do the exact same thing, they'll do it two totally different ways because they're two totally different individuals, even though they're twins. And that's by God's divine design. Because if you think about a net, and you think you think about a net, a net is only as effective as its ability to catch what it was created for. And I really need you all to catch that. I'm going to say it again. A net is only as effective as the, the, the strength and the quality that was put into the weed that was put in it and what it was created for. What that means is the more intersection that there is in a net, the smaller those holes between the materials, the more uh, effective the net is because it's gonna catch more. It's mm -hmm. gonna catch more of what you wanna hold on to and let through what you don't want. Because if the holes are really, really big, yeah, you're gonna catch the bigger pieces of what you want, but some of the smaller pieces of what you want are gonna slip through those holes. So God is making this real, real fine, like a screen that you have, like the, like the screen you have in your screen door. There are holes in there, but the screen is really, really fine. The holes are really, really small. That means anything solid, if you were to pour, let's just, if you were cooking macaroni, let's say, and you decide to pour the macaroni, you take the door down and you lay the door down across a bowl and, and you pour the macaroni out on the screen, all the macaroni is going to sit up on top of the screen and all the water is going to go through to the bowl. Why? Because the screen is designed to catch the macaroni, but it's designed to allow the water to come through because the water is not what you want to keep. The macaroni is. By us doing our part to be the strand in, the, in that net that God created us to be, he didn't create me to be a strand by the name of T.D. Jakes. He didn't create you to be the strand by the name of somebody else. He created you to be the strand that carries your name. As we are the strands that God has created us to be, and those strands are placed in their proper place in God's tapestry in the way of netting, what's going to happen is that net is going to be reinforced to be able to catch those souls, and each of us have an active role to play through our definition of ministry, through our helping. Helping might be buying somebody groceries one day. Helping might be uh, simultaneously for one person while one person is buying somebody groceries. Somebody else across town might be helping somebody across the street. And while that's happening, somebody simultaneously out in the suburbs might be evangelizing to somebody. And while that's happening, somebody else simultaneously might be praying the prayer of salvation with somebody else. God uses each of us differently but he's using each of us differently in many instances at the same time. That's why the word says that one man plants, another man waters, but it's God that provides the increase. And we don't know where we are in that journey for people. But we have to realize that the abilities that God gave us, he gave them to us for a reason because they're valuable. And he gave them to us for a season, which is a life that we have. And he gave them to us for a purpose, which is the definition of what ministry is, and that's to help somebody. And if we remember nothing else, if we remember those three things every day that the Lord wakes us up, those three things should motivate us to get up and get out and, and get into doing the work of ministry. The word puts it this way. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that you stir up the gifts of God, which are in you by the putting on of my hands. And what was being said here, and we're all familiar with this passage of scripture, uh, Timothy was talking about the laying on of hands. And the laying on of hands in the church is symbolic of the transfer of what? Holy Spirit power. Exactly. The anointing, the Holy Spirit. So when the hands were laid on, um, laid on Timothy, Paul is reminding Timothy, look, the anointing was transferred to you. I was there. I saw it. I saw him lay hands on you. I saw how you responded. I saw that you were sold out. I saw that you accepted the calling. I saw that you're anointed and equipped and appointed for such a time as this. So I need you to stir up the gift that's in you. I need you to remember that you're a strand in that net. And I need you to stop being a strand that's going left and stop being a strand that's weak and, 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 and unwilling or unable to be pulled tight because netting and screening is best when it's pulled tight. When I worked at the hardware store, we used to cut glass and we used to cut screening. And for screens, we had the capacity to actually install the screens for the people. And the screen could be cut the perfect size. But what, took, what, what it took for that screen to be useful was a little rubber 
piece that you had a tool to roll down in there. And that rubber, little rubber piece pulled the screen tight all the way around and it held the screen in place. And that's what God is, is, is wanting us to do. He's wanting us to get in our proper place and, and allow him to pull us and strengthen us and position us and not be afraid of what he's doing in us because Paul went on to let Timothy know that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and one of love and one of a sound mind, meaning he knows that we know exactly where it is that we're supposed to be provided we're listening to him. And as long as we're following his purpose in ministry and following his purpose in doing the work of ministry and following his purpose in being all that God has called us to be in ministry, we can be effective witnesses and we can be effective in helping other people by being used by God and not being ashamed of being used by God. You ever run into people that um, say that they're ministers? Yeah, I'm a minister at such and such church and I do this and I do that. Okay, well, well can, can you pray for me? Well, I, I don't really want to pray right here. I kind of do that. That's not what ministry is all about. Ministry is about meeting people where they are. Jesus met people where they were. Before he spoke to them in language they could understand, and before he used examples they could relate to, Jesus met people where they were. You don't believe me? The woman with the issue of blood, last time I checked, it didn't say in the Bible that Jesus went with her to the doctor's office and put on a lab coat and put her up on the table after they put the tissue paper on it. No, it says that when she touched the hem of his garment, where he was in the midst of the crowd, as I paraphrase, you know, he let her know that, that her faith has made her whole. You know, he didn't go to the, um, to the funeral home to see Lazarus. He waited till Lazarus was in the ground dead and stinking four days and had him roll the stone away. And he called him forth. And Lazarus came out in that state that he was put in, but he wasn't in the same state. What am I saying? I'm saying God meets people where they are. He does that so that as the power that he desires to move through us, ministers to others, helps others. There's no doubting and no mistaking where it came from because it's so grand and so undeniable and so extraordinary that there's no way it could be us, but it's God's super that's imposed over our natural. That's what ministry is. Make sense? Yep. yep. Which, which leads us to our, our, our fourth point, our last point. Your ministry is important to God because this is a full-time commitment and not something that you do in your free time. And that's where the passion of your ministry comes from. You know, we talk about passion, the movie, The Passion of the Christ. We talk about Passion Week, which is going to be coming up in about a week and a half. And, um, you know, what is passion? You know, passion is, is used synonymously with the word love. But passion is more than just love. Love is an action word. Passion is violent action and not violent from the standpoint, I'm going to kill somebody. Violent is in, you know, I'm, I mean this thing. This thing is, is absolute. I'm doing this thing so that there's no doubt in your mind when I'm done doing whatever the, this thing is that I'm doing with and to whomever it is one's doing it with and to, there's not going to be no doubt in your mind where how I feel about you stands. That's why I court they, they talk about, you know, between lovers and affairs and stuff like that, when the murder takes place, crimes of what? Crimes of passion. Passion. The crimes of passion because the individual that perpetrated the crime wanted to make sure that the individual that was a recipient of what he or she was perpetrating, they wanted to make sure that they knew beyond a reasonable doubt, I mean what the heck I'm doing. And I, there's no coming back from this. And that's why many of those, many times those crimes are very up close and very, very personal. You know, and God wants us to be up close and personal with our ministry. He doesn't want us to have just a blanket ministry. Um, and, and I'll qualify what I'm saying in a minute. He doesn't want us to have just a blanket ministry that we just kind of sprinkle across the masses, whatever ministry gifts that we have, and it falls on everybody. And there's a place for that because the word talks about as it pertains to Peter, that there was a season and an instance where wherever his shadow passed, individuals were healed. There is a place for that. 
But what God desires us to do in ministry is to be up close and personal. Jesus, by and large, did most of his ministry in small groups and in small settings. Yes, he did feed multitudes. Yes, he did, th did things for multitudes, and those things are absolutely appropriate. The majority of the ministry gifts and works that God did, he did in interactions with individuals. He met them at that point of need. He met them very personally. He met them in a very real way. And because he met them very personally and because he met them in a very real way, the impact that he had because his meaning for doing it is I'm doing this in such a way so that by the time that I'm done with you, there is no doubt in your mind who it is that I am. But you have to make the decision. You have to make the decision and qualify and, and quantify who I am by confessing it with your mouth. But I'm going to do all that I can to make sure that you know who I am. And many of the individuals that he did miracles for came to him because they understood who he was, you know, and that's the blessing in it. And that's, uh, that's what God wants us to do. And that's how God desires us to live. He desires us to live our lives and live in ministry with and in passion. And that's the blessing of it. That's the blessing of it. And that's what God wants us to do. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The word puts it this way. Therefore, again, I'm going back to where I started. In essence, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We can stop right there. You know, since we have this ministry, you know, God's given it to us. There's no denying that he's given it to us because we're his. And since we receive mercy, which we have, because that's in essence, that's what salvation is. Our job is not to faint, meaning our job is not to just, whew, okay, I made it in and go somewhere and sit down. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're supposed to do. Just like somebody prayed for us and they had us on their mind and they helped us, whether it was directly and we saw it or indirectly, and we're reaping the benefits of it, you know, we can't faint. We've got to sow the very thing that we reaped unknowingly because that's how this perpetually goes on. You know, that, that's what God desires to, to do with and, and, and through us. And that's the perpetual dynamic. That's the perpetual dynamic of ministry that God desires us to sow and desires us to use. That's why it goes on to say that the, the, about renouncing the hidden things of dishonesty. In other words, the passion that we have has got to be fueled by the love that's so pure that we truly are doing this thing from an agape mindset. We're doing this thing with the intent of giving the individuals that we're doing it for the very best of God, even if it means the very worst for us, which takes us right back to Jesus. Jesus sought to give us the very best and did give us the very best through laying his life down for us, but it cost him the very worst. It cost him a being beaten. It cost him uh, uh, being uh, impaled. It cost him having thorns, three inch thorns shoved into his head from his hairline all the way down to his eyebrows and having gashes all the way down. It cost him being beaten with uh, canine tails to the point that his back was torn open. You could see traces of his organs. It, it, it cost him all of that, but he didn't mind paying the price because he understood and knew that in paying that price, you know, that uh, paying that price gave us the opportunity to be used by him to do the same thing. And that's what God desires us to do. This goes on to say, um, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, meaning being, us being passionate about what we're doing and us being passionate about the, the ministry that we're offering us being so excited about being able to help that person. I'm so excited to tell you about Jesus. I want to help you right now. I really, let, let me help you out. Let me, let me coach you on some things. Let me get you up to some things. Let me get you up to speed on some stuff. There's a better way to do this. There's a better way to live. You don't have to live by just getting by. I remember um, when I was working for one of the, the, 
I call them schemes now because I know better, but at the time, you know, opportunities that was presented to me, uh, one of them was very creative and I still remember it. One of them would talk about how, why would you want a job? A job is designed to keep you just over broke. You should want a career and to own something of your own because that's what gives you the wealth and everything that you need. And they made, they made a very compelling argument. And a lot of us want to live our lives ministerially where we're just over spiritual bankruptcy. We're just over being broke spiritually. Well, how many souls realistically can we win if we're just over broke spiritually? Not many. God wants us to be in abundance. He wants us to, to, to live in such a way so that we're living exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think because that's the type of God we serve. And because we serve a type of God that can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or even think, we've got to function according to the power that's at work in us, which should be his power by his spirit. And that's the key to the passion and ministry, the passion that Jesus had to set his face like Flint to go back and raise Lazarus from Lazarus from the dead, knowing that him doing that was going to usher in a chain of events that would ultimately lead to him being laid in a tomb and him getting up three days later. Who would have thought that that trip in that approximately two weeks of travel, the world is literally, we all know it, would have been changed. And it started and ended with the same thing, a resurrection from a death. A resurrection in the first case from a natural death, in the second case, a resurrection from a planned death to bring about salvation. But the formula is still there. And through, with us through ministry, we're living examples of the resurrection power of Christ every single day. Because he saved each and every one of us from death as a result of salvation. We're walking dead if we really want to keep it real. Forget about the show on, on AMC. We're the walking dead. And we're not walking around looking for brains like zombies are. We're walking around seeking souls. That's why the name of the weekend is, is Soul Search Weekend. Lord, drop that in my spirit because you all are out searching for souls. You're not searching for them for you. You're searching for them for me. And in the process of searching for them for me, as you find them by doing what it is that I've called you to do and equipped you to do uniquely, as, as you said, Mel, and you said perfectly, and, and, and being sincere about it and being diligent and vigilant about it, Chris, as you say it perfectly, not only am I going to honor you with what you pray for and ask for, but I'm going to give you overflow that you can then use in, in the church that you're establishing for me. And those people can be trained and go out and do likewise. And y'all can do it even bigger the next time. Because it's mm -hmm. about glorifying God and not glorifying ourselves. So if we, we look back at it. Our ministry is important for four reasons as we summarize everything, you know, it's important because of the scope of it, the essence of it, the definition of it, and the passion of it. And if you remember those four things, the, the, the reasons in detail will be in your mind. Because of the scope of it, you understand that you are one of a kind. And because you're a one-of-a-kind individual, guess what? You got a one-of-a-kind ministry. So you don't have to feel threatened or feel belittled or feel inadequate by what somebody else is doing. God didn't create you to do that. Stay in your lane and rejoice in knowing that God created you to be the best version of you that you can be. And be just that, the ver best version of you. Because the best version of you runs circles around an invitation to somebody else seven days a week. From the essence of your ministry, understand that, that each and every person is called to serve God. We all call to service. This is not a situation like the military here in the United States where, where it, it, it's, a, it's a voluntary thing. You don't sign up for selective service. There is no selective service. You give the best of your service to God through serving God as a result of salvation through Jesus Christ. There is no negotiating. God wants the very best of our service. And as we give him the very best of our service and our ministry, the essence of it comes out. If you think about orange juice, the best part of orange juice comes out when what? The orange is squeezed the tightest. 
So don't think that because we're being squeezed in areas that God's forgotten about us, I would beg the difference. Not that he's forgotten about us, it's that he's keenly focused on us because he knows what's in us and what's in us has to come out of us. And the only way it can come out sometimes is by being squeezed. Which, is, which leads us to the definition of our ministry. The definition of our ministry means that he squeezes us to get out of us what he put in us so we can use it to serve others. It's our mindset. We have to set our minds on being a blessing and not being blessed. As we set our minds on being a blessing, God will bless us because he's using us to bless others. And we have to make up our minds that we got to be passionate about this. Just like um, in, in Wall Street, the Wall Street franchise, when Gordon Gecko used to say money never sleeps. Guess what? Salvation never sleeps. Ministry never sleeps. Soul winning never sleeps. Evangelism never sleeps. Prayer never sleeps. Study never sleeps. Fellowship never sleeps. Doing this thing God's way never sleeps. So if it never sleeps, we can never be found in a state of not being aware. We have to always be found, as the word says, uh, being instant, in season and out of season, offering the, the, the fruit of our ministry. So if we look at that at our, on our personal purposes list, our list is growing. You know, purpose number five. Uh, this week, we're adding to that list uh, to be a faithful minister of the gospel to God's people. And I want us to get used to seeing this list because this list is our personal purposes of living witness ministries. And I want it to become our personal purposes as individuals that our ministries will become living witnesses of who God is in our lives and before others. So these purposes are personal. We're in essence writing our own version of purpose-driven living, purpose driven living through gaining insight on the personal purposes. And God truly gives us these purposes in a personal fashion because he knows when it's personal, it's, it's reaching the heart. And if it's coming from God's heart and reaching our hearts, that is truly a winning combination. And that's how God desires us to function and be a, be a blessing to, to others. Amen. 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 Well, we Living Witness Ministries is a church on the move that's dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through the preached and taught word, community outreach, and practical ministry designed to save souls and change lives. You can sow into the ministry via our cash app at dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. That's dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. Sow your seed in the good ground of Living Witness Ministries today. And thank you for helping us reach the world with the life-giving word. We pray that you were blessed by today's broadcast and would love to hear from you. If you have any prayer requests, praise reports, or would like to learn more about Living Witness Ministries, you can contact us by email at livingtowitness at gmail.com. That's the word living, the number two, witness at gmail.com. Or reach us by phone at area code 404 Nine five five eight eight four six. Again, that's area code four zero four nine five five eight eight four six. Until next time, we encourage you to continue to live your life as a living witness.